Good morning, good day, good evening. I am, as always, your host, Brody Robertson. This is episode 88 of Take of a Tea. My hair still looks absolutely horrible. And recently, I have been trying out the Linux Zen kernel. So, I've been wanting to do a video on different kernels you can use for Linux for quite a while. And I don't know why, I just... I just finally got around to actually doing this. I haven't really planned out a video specifically about the Zen kernel, but I do have one... I don't know if I... Have I recorded it? Wait, give me one second. I don't know if I've recorded it yet. <clears throat> I recorded it yet or just planned it. Uh, I have not recorded it yet. I've just planned it. I've recorded the video... Sorry. Planned a video about the different kernels that you can use for Arch Linux. I'm going to be focusing on the um, the main kernels, so those being the um, the Linux kernel, Linux Zen, Linux LTS, and there's one more, isn't there? Is there one more? Wait, is there only three? Wait. Arch Linux kernels. I feel like there was four. Am I just imagining a fourth kernel, or am I forgetting one? Stay... Oh, hardened. Of course, hardened, yeah. So there's uh, stable, which is the main one. That is the Linux package. Then you have Linux hardened, Linux LTS, and Linux Zen. Um, and after doing that video, I wanted to go and try out the Zen kernel and sort of see what it was going to be like. At this stage, I don't really have anything, like, to say about it. Like, this is the weird thing. So, <clears throat> a lot of... <clears throat> oh, God. We good? Okay, yeah, we're good. Um, a lot of the benefits that supposedly come from using the Zen kernel are sort of... I guess they're hard to measure effects. They're things like your windows feel snappier to move around and other little things like that. But there are actually some measurable benefits and those are what I'm going to be focusing the video on. Obviously, I'll bring those things up uh, to spoil the video. Um... I don't really notice a difference when it comes to, like, the general computing experience. It feels basically as it did before. Like, there's nothing really different in that respect. But where it does potentially differ, I haven't actually run the numbers yet, but it does feel better, is in things like um, game load times and also game frame rates because the Zen kernel has a feature built into it called F-Sync. Now, I don't fully understand F-Sync, but it's supposed to be something about better utilizing uh, more cores or something like that. I don't exactly um, know the whole detail with it, um, but I will be running numbers on that. We're running a couple of benchmarks just to see whether whether there's actually a a reasonable difference between them. Um and I'll obviously look into like how F Sync actually works, like what it's actually doing before I do that video. This is more like me just in the early planning stages of actually going through that. Because unlike a lot of my other videos where I can sort of just like, you know, uh dick them out, blow them out, smash them out, smash them out, that's the one I'm thinking of smash blow them out. I uh, Smash it out in a couple of hours. Um, with this one, I actually want to put some, you know, on the ground experience, actually trying it out for a while and seeing what it's actually like. Because while I can just, you know, I can talk about it with that couple of hours of experience, I don't think I can really say whether it's a justified move over without properly, um, properly looking into it like that. But from my brief experience, um, Frame rates I don't notice because every game that I play, I run with a locked frame rate and I lock it to 60. So if it's at 60 anyway, like I'm not noticing a difference there. I will um I will unlock it when I do the test just to see what's actually gonna happen. But with Final Fantasy 14, I noticed the loading into the game feels a bit quicker. I don't know if it's actually quicker, but it does seem like it is quicker. So, if it is, that's good. If it's not, and I'm just imagining it, well, that's what the numbers are actually going to tell us. I don't know what games I'm actually going to use to benchmark it. Obviously, I'm going to be using Final Fantasy because I, I play a lot of Final Fantasy. Um, but I'll probably also look into games that are known to work really well and known to work really poorly with F-Sync just to see if there is... 
you know, some difference there, or if just generally the Zen kernel is a a better experience, or it might be a worse experience. I don't know. Because when you look up stuff about the Zen kernel, the vast majority of what you see is people saying, the Zen kernel makes my computer feel faster. But there's very, very few videos on the actual numbers. Like, here is objectively how much better the experience is. And I sort of want to fill that gap. Um, people have been asking me to talk about kernels for a long time, and... You know, it, I, I might as well do that. Now, there are some other things with the Zen kernel which are obviously very measurable. Uh, measurable. Things like how the Zen kernel has a bunch of extra modules that you would want to use for general user computing that are not enabled by default with a different kernel like the Linux kernel. Um, for example, like the module needed to run Anbox. I can't remember what the module is actually called... Uh, install Anbox. Let's see what it says. Uh, do, 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 do. If, please read install kernel modules. Yes, that one. Uh, Anbox modules DKMS. Okay, it's just, it's just the Anbox mod. Oh, here we go. Um, Ashmem and Binder. Those are two modules you need to run with N uh, Anbox, which aren't enabled by default or don't even come with the, uh, the stable version of the Linux kernel. And I want to try out Anbox at some point, so that's something I will be talking about basically as well. That's something that is, you know, objectively there. Like, it is either not there or it is there. That's very easy to quantify. The general user experience is going to be considerably more difficult, but I think it's valuable content, even though... Even though I, I don't expect the video to do super well. Um, so I'll be framing it from an Arch Linux perspective, but... Like, the Zen kernel, the Harden kernel, the LTS kernel aren't just a, a Arch Linux thing. Um, the versions being used by Arch are patched in certain ways to make them better in the Arch experience, things like, things that the Arch maintainers want to add, but the Zen kernel, I think, yeah, it was originally made for Debian, um, LTS, the most known LTS that you would use is something like, um, Ubuntu LTS, now, running the LTS kernel on Arch doesn't turn Arch into a, you know, LTS, uh, into a, um, stable, into an LTS distro, anything like that. It just means the kernel won't be updated until the next version of LTS comes out, uh, which you can find out over on kernel.org. So the current latest LTS is 4.19.214. Um, that came out, I guess. Actually, wow, they just updated it. Um, that came out yesterday, apparently. And then there's Linux Next. Uh, Linux Next isn't actually part of the the four main kernels you can get on Arch, but you can go and obviously install it. Um, you can install, like, any kernel you want. Uh, for example, you could get the Git kernel, which is basically just going to the the Linux Git repo and literally just compiling it. Um, you know, I wouldn't recommend doing that because there's a reason why they don't release the kernel like that. It's because getting the latest Git commit is always going to be in many ways, unstable because it hasn't been fully tested or there's going to be extra things that need to be added to actually make it stable, things like that. So if you wanted to go with any of the any of the more bleeding edge kernels, it probably makes more sense to go with the next kernel. The next kernel is basically a, a step ahead of the, the latest stable kernel. Uh, think of it like a beta test for the stable kernel. And all of, of all or most of those features that are in the next kernel will be merged into stable when stable moves up to that and then next will be further ahead. This is basically if you <clears throat> this basically if you need the absolute bleeding edge. So like, I don't know, you um there's some like weird technology that's just being supported in the kernel and uh, I don't. I honestly don't have a great example for it. It's like maybe some like new CPU architecture for for, for example, not like a mainline CPU architecture like an Intel or an AMD. Some third, like not third. Some like 
uh, extra, um, extra arch- architect- architecture, extra architecture that may take time to be supported. Things like that are the reason why you might want to run Next. For general consumers, running Next really is not the best. Or maybe it's something like you're doing some research work and the drivers for whatever thing you need to be working with are going to be merged in in the Next kernel. Things like that. That's sort of why you might want to use that kernel. But there's plenty of other kernels you can go with, and that's before you even go to doing things like compiling your own kernel, which I wouldn't recommend doing. The problem with um, with compiling your own kernel is when you compile your own kernel, you need to then compile your own kernel every time a new kernel version comes out, or whenever you want to migrate to the next version, which is annoying. But the Arch build system does make it better, so... Hey, that's that's something. Uh, even though the ABS is a bit of a meme, it's getting better, but it's it's a bit of a meme still. Um, yeah, for, for most people though, for most people, unless unless you're trying to do something really weird, you can go with one of these uh these these four kernels. Hardened is sort of here. It's it's here in the case of, I guess, more of a. I wouldn't say server use case. LTS makes more sense in a server use case. Hardened is when you really, really care about security, but you're willing to mitigate performance. Like, this is the problem with going down the hardcore security route. It's generally going to be a trade-off between performance and security or convenience and security. There's not really any world where you get both of these. Um, a A great example of this is... Take a, a YubiKey or some of these other hardware, uh, what are they called? Hardware two-factor authentication devices. They are incredibly secure because unless the the code generation mechanism on that device ends up being cracked, there's no way you can unlock the account without having that little that little doodad. Unless there's obviously like a, a flaw in the the account system that you're actually using it for, but in cases where that's not the case, you need the the little physical thing to actually unlock stuff, which means that if you forget that at some point, even though it's incredibly secure, if you leave it at home and you want to unlock something at uni, well, now you can't do it because you don't have your little doodad. This is the sort of big problem, or maybe in a, a more... Actually, no, a great example of this is... With the, what was it, Spectre and Meltdown, uh, where there was predictive branch execution, where this branch execution was allowing, I think it was like a memory exploit or something like that. Um, and when you got rid of that or you seriously hampered the way the bran- the uh, predictive branch execution worked, that also came with a pretty big uh, performance um, degradation. So by getting rid of that, it made the system more secure, but it also came with that performance downgrade. It's not like you always get a performance downgrade when you have a uh, a security upgrade. For example, moving to you know a newer version of the Linux kernel or a newer version of um, SSH or something like that. Generally, it's not going to be a slower system, but you are going to get those security benefits. It's just that when you really go heavily down one path or the other, you're going to have to sort of get rid of some of it. Like, if you're going down the extreme performance route, there's a lot of stuff you can just completely get rid of that you don't really need. Um, like if you really care about performance, for example, you wouldn't ever use an encrypted, um, an encrypted boot drive, because it's going to take longer to load. But, obviously, it's more secure. I don't know. Basically, basically what I'm getting at here is the trade-off is important, and um, for most people, you probably don't need to worry about the hardened kernel. That's that's where we were going from with that. Basically. Um, I'll get back to you guys on how my experience with the Zen kernel actually has been. Um, but... That'll be happening at a later date. Now, I thought there was a pretty big problem with the Zen kernel this morning. So, I was doing a stream. Today, I'm recording this on Thursday. I normally do a stream around 10am. 
um, I thought there was a pretty big problem with the Zen kernel. So I was trying to record something with OBS, and it was fine. I hit the start streaming button. My camera goes down to like 10 FPS. Audio is massively desynced. I go to my game scene, the game video and the game audio, while the game video isn't lagging, are massively desynced. So I had to restart my system, swap over to another kernel, and the problem was still there. I, I honestly thought it was a Zen kernel problem because I hadn't updated OBS, I hadn't updated my video drivers, I, I don't know what had happened. I thought maybe there was some like weird problem with my scene in OBS. So when the regular kernel didn't fix it, I swapped over to a different scene, which I knew was working, and it was going fine. Now, that would have made sense. I thought like, oh, maybe like OBS changed something in an update because I hadn't streamed since the last OBS update I had actually know that. Yeah, maybe, you know what, maybe in the last OBS update, something broke. Possible. Um, but I went to that main scene, the, like, it was the scene I used for recording my regular videos, went to that, sat there for, like, 15 minutes playing the game, and then someone showed up at the stream asking, like, oh, where's the clock you normally have in the, uh, the top left-hand corner, the left, that one, that, yeah, right is left, whatever, the top left-hand corner. Um, so I was like, okay, I can show you what it's like with my scene being broken, I went to my broken scene, and everything was working. It just... It was just working. It's not like my game was too demanding because I was playing on the PS4, so the only thing my computer was doing was acting as a capture PC. And, yeah, it, it just started working again. I was really confused, and for the rest of the stream, it was completely fine. So, I, I really don't know what was happening with OBS. Clearly, something had broken. I don't know what, and I don't know why it started working. I don't know if it's going to start being a problem tomorrow. I might have to do, like, a test private stream or something like that just to see if it's going to keep occurring. But when I was going through that problem, I sort of checked everything that I, would, I thought could have been an issue. Things like, oh, maybe I'm streaming at the wrong bitrate. Maybe I'm running the wrong encoder settings, and I've got it set to, like... Ex what whatever what is it um got it set to like my CPU usage preset to like the highest preset it could be nope everything was still exactly as it should be so there was obviously some problem that OBS was having at the start there that I don't know how to have fixed but if the problem just fixes itself I guess it's not that big of a deal um. I don't know. I should go... If it, if it keeps happening tomorrow, I'm absolutely going to be looking into it. If it just disappears, I'll just treat it as Linux being weird one day. I'll do a system update, see if there's an OBS update as well, um, and basically go from there. That's that's really the only thing I, I can do. Um, obviously, I can go check like OBS logs, things like that, but besides doing that, that's just... Go, just going ahead and seeing what happens again is really, really all I, I actually have the ability to do. Now, speaking of having, you know what, having the ability to do. There we go. That's a segue and a half. Um, we're going to mute this audio so I don't get a copyright strike. Um, so, I don't know if you guys, actually, did I mention it last time? I think I mentioned it, no, not last time, the, the week before probably. So. There is, of course, you can't see it like that because it's too big. Um, there is an HD remake or H, not HD remake, H, HD remaster of the, uh, what is it, GTA Vice City, GTA 3, and San Andreas. And the trailer for that came out about a week ago. About a week ago as of recording this, two weeks ago as you're watching this. And honestly... I'm I'm still undecided on how I feel about it. So right now what you're seeing is the the regular graphics, how it would look if you're running it on the PS2 or running the PC version or the iPhone version or Android version, whatever you whatever you're running. And then this is how it looks with the new updated graphics. Now, I think the world, I think they've done a beautiful job with the world and it looks really good like they've clearly done a lot of work with like the foliage even though there's not much foliage in the desert area uh the 
<laughs> the, the sunset looks good. There's clearly improved textures on the uh, on the mountains, even though they're not amazing textures. But where it gets kind of weird is with the um, the character models. Yeah, um, like the early GTA games always had a a very cartoony style. And they seem to have continued with the cartoony style, but I don't know. It it looks it looks really jarring and really really weird. And like, there's clearly no hair physics put into a lot of the characters. Like that hair there is just not moving. Like the world, the world looks fucking gorgeous. Look at this. Like this train. This train is beautiful. The, the lighting here is beautiful. Now, the lighting is going to be... Um, the reason why the lighting looks good is because that uh, is being done by uh, Unreal. So this is basically the game's being ported into Unreal with slightly better textures and much better lighting. Because Unreal 4, Unreal 5, whatever the latest version of Unreal is, has some pretty in impressive textures. Clearly, really good reflections as well. And as I said, the world looks really good. My problem is the character models look a little bit jank. Like, they... They've clearly improved them, but... I don't know, some of them just stand out a lot. Like, this this vest, or this, um... Not this vest, this shirt. Uh... It looks like it's sort of hugging his body. It looks like it's a lycra suit. Obviously, like, he's wearing a shirt that's too small for his body... Like, that's the, sort of the joke there. But it doesn't look like a shirt that's too small. It looks like it's it's Lycra. Here we go. Here's another shot. So this is of um, Vice City. Like, Vice City? Actually, I'll stop it before it starts. Here we go. Vice City, you know, it looks very dated on the PS2. This looks really, really good. The lighting effects are great. The lighting effects here are great. Fucking character models look janky. Um, yeah, here we go. Here's another great example. Like, the nightlife looks amazing as well. I mean, here's another shirt where it looks like kind of lycra. It looks like... It, it's way too shiny. It, it's way too, you know, gripping to his, uh, to his chest. But yeah, nightlife here looks beautiful as well. Um, yeah, here's a great example of the effects. So... This is GTA 3. This is the oldest in the games. I want to pause in the middle there. Uh, uh, yeah. There we go. Oh, perfect. So, this is the original game. Like, you can clearly tell it's a very early PS2 game. The lights don't even look like they're lights. Um, and then this. There's this beautiful rain effect. Obviously, you know, you've got to show off your reflections every time you show off any sort of uh, <laughs> any sort of graphical improvements. That's just the default way to show that your graphics have been improved. And yeah, it it just it world like I, I keep going back to the world. The world looks really good. And that, actually, that's a great ex great example there of it being a very cartoony style originally. Like this dude looks like a cartoony cowboy. I actually haven't played all the way through um, Vice City. That's that's the only of the trilogy I haven't played through. Here you go. Here's another great shot of the reflections being great. Like those, they still look fairly flat, but they look much much closer to actual headlights. Also, these trees look really nice as well. I don't know whether I'd pay full price for it. I don't know whether I'll do that, but I am definitely interested in playing it. The only concern that I do have with it is the soundtrack. So, all of the early GTA games have a lot of music that have been removed in the PC version because, you know, licenses expire, things like that. Obviously, you can go back and play the early um, PS2 version and any of the other systems where they couldn't be updated perfectly fine. They still have the entire soundtracks, but the PC version and... Uh, also, the iPhone version, Android version have had sounds removed. For example, I, I think I've mentioned this one before. At the start of Vice City, uh, when you get in your first car, it's supposed to be playing Billie Jean. But 
that song got removed. Now it's playing a different song. Uh, I actually don't know what song is in its place at this point, but like that sort of changes up the entire early vibe of the game. Obviously, it's not a big deal, but sort of one of the things that makes the GTA games so fun is their radios, and losing out on a lot of that music really does hurt it. And the the game I played the most out of the original, uh, I guess not original three, out of the um, out of these three, the the, tr- the I guess the original three D trilogy. I guess that's why it's the trilogy. Um, of the original three D trilogy was San Andreas. I I think San Andreas is still the best GTA game in the entire series. I don't really care what anyone has to say about any of the other games. Um, I I genuinely just love San Andreas. I always played the... What was the rock channel in San Andreas called? Uh, San Andreas Rock Station. What was it called? Um, Radio X, was it? Yes, Radio X. But, like, all of the stations were really good. Let's go to... I think it was Radio X and... Radio Los Santos that I played the most? Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, Radio Los Santos was the, um... That was the... That was the the rap channel. Um... Yeah, here we go. So, Radio X. We had Helmet by Unsung. Uh, what a, what a what fun stuff was in... Guns N' Roses, Welcome to the Jungle. That that song right there needs to be in the game. Like, I've, I've played... I've played through San Andreas so much that if I do not hear Welcome to the Jungle, I will be very depressed. Actually, I'm not showing the list. Um, Ozzy Osbourne, Hellraiser, Rage Against the Machine, Killing in the Name. Like, all of these songs, if any of them are removed, I feel like sort of really destroy a lot of the, um, a lot of the vibe, a lot of the vibe that you get from San Andreas. And the exact same thing is true for any of the, uh, any of those GTA games. Um, I don't remember what station I played when I was playing Vice City. I actually, yeah, I don't remember. Um, Vice City, uh, Vice City stations. What was the station? I, it, it's been a long, long time since I last played Vice City. So I have a much, yeah, I have much less of a um a memory of of that game. Um I think it was V Rock that I played, yeah. Which has, you know, some fucking great tracks in here as well. Uh Twist the Sister, I Wanna Rock. Um Come and Feel the Noise. All of these are fucking great songs. Two Minutes to Midnight by Iron Maiden. Um Peace Cells by Megadeth. Raining Blood by Slayer. Like, all of this. All of this is great. The other thing that I don't know if it's going to be there, so one of the things that... I know, obviously, like, the 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 ultimate end game of any GTA game is really playing with mods, but because I played on the PS2, obviously, I didn't have access to mods. So what I did towards the end of the game was always messing around with cheat codes. I... I don't know if they're going to be there. I, I have no idea. Um, They very well could be. They could re-add them into the game. But I... I will be annoyed if... I'll be annoyed if they are not... If they are not in the game. Actually, I, I just saw... Okay, so there's actually a little marker here on here about songs that have been removed. So Radio X, Hellraiser, and Killing the Name are both gone. Really? Okay. Um, yeah. I, I, I definitely listen to those, those, are uh, a lot. But yeah, I was saying about cheat codes. So, that's actually part of the reason why San Andreas was my favorite in, uh, in that 3D trilogy. So, Vice... Uh, Actually, GTA 3 didn't have didn't have flying because uh, <laughs> that game didn't actually have aerial vehicles outside of like a one mission where you got a a helicopter. And the reason why it didn't is because the buildings, in many cases, did not have a roof. 
Uh, it was a very early, very early PS2 game, and they didn't really know how to handle the system properly, so obviously they're going to cut some corners. Vice City introduced flying, uh, introduced a flying cheat, but it was more like a bunny hop cheat. Like, you would jump up and then fall back down. You'd keep going like this. It never worked as nicely as San Andreas did, because San Andreas, you could get into a jetpack, you could get into... Um, you could get into a a helicopter, a plane, and just fly it around the city. San Andreas was the first proper 3D uh, 3D GTA game. The ones before it were 3D, but they still had limitations on the verticality. San Andreas got rid of that. Obviously, there was like a max height you could go because you know planes can't go above a certain height, but like it didn't stop you, you know getting into a helicopter and just landing on top of a billboard if that's what you wanted to do. And because of that, the uh, the car flying cheat worked basically by turning your car into a plane. That's pretty much what it did. It was a bit easier to fly than a plane, but it basically acted like a plane. And I hope that's there. I hope they give it... I hope... I do hope they give it a good treatment. I hope that... Rockstar isn't just trying to basically turn this into a way to make money without really any any love for the games. I I don't have look, I'm not very hopeful. I am going to wait. I will not pre-order or anything stupid like that. I will wait, see what it's like, and hey, even if the cheat codes are removed, if at some point you can get it on sale for like 20 bucks for all three of those games, and the soundtrack isn't removed, hey, it's probably worth it. Because, look, at the end of the day, if the soundtrack is removed, um, you might as well just go play the original versions, like, on on either an emulator, um, you can, like, crank the emulator up to 4K, or just play the PC version and crank it full of ENBs. Because you can make San Andreas... Uh, look really good. Let's see if we can find... Uh, is this... Wait, is that GTA... Uh, GTA SA 5 Graphic ENB. Uh, I'm guessing it makes it look somewhat like GTA 5. Um, let's have a look. No, I don't want to pre-order Call of Duty Vanguard. Okay, even this is, like, not a great ENB. Like, this is an ENB from, uh, two years ago. What is this road? Why does the road look like it's made of bricks? <laughs> this is not... Why is the road made of bricks? What the hell? Oh, and they've not updated the, uh, the character models, it would seem. But, like, this looks way better than the game originally did. Let's see if we can find a better one. Uh, GCA SA ENB. Actually, if I look up... Gr Actually, yeah, this is a good video. This is a really good video. Uh, I've, I know I've seen this one before. No, go away, ad. Don't care. Uh, here we go. Uh, no, I don't care about your, your damn memes. Uh, show me driving or something. Okay, those models look a little bit jank. Um, that's how to... This is... Okay, maybe maybe this is a different video than the one that I originally saw. But, like, you can make a game like this look really, really, really good. Actually, yeah, here's, here's one. Here's one I know I've seen. <laughs> like, the, the mountains look ridiculous. But, like, the stuff that doesn't look ridiculous, like the cars, they look really good. Like, really, really good. Look at this car. Like, uh, uh, it's a beautiful car. So you can do a lot with mods in these games if you are, uh, if you, if you spend the time looking for the right mods that are going to give you the sort of the sort of style that you you're sort of going for. But if this is if this is a well preserved version, I will play it, and I'm sure that someone like Mudaha is going to talk about this basically on the day that it comes out. So I will uh, I will definitely know about it. Now. I, um, 
One of the things that caused my channel to like pop off recently was talking about the Linus Tech Tips uh, Linux gaming challenge thingy. Now, I thought that their video had uploaded to YouTube. I was ready to start like planning out a response because I'm going to respond and milk it for views. Um, because that's what I did last time and it, it went well. Anyway, I thought that they had uploaded the, uh, the the first part of it. So we had this goodbye Windows thumbnail. I didn't even pay attention to the fact they were talking about a, th a uh, server here. So I clicked on this expecting, oh yeah, this is going to be the start of the Linux gaming challenge. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't because it, it was actually the... Uh, them replacing Windows Server on their final server running Windows, because apparently they were running Windows Server in their their data storage solution for their video editors or whatever the hell they were using it for. Um, so I clicked on that, got debated, and that annoyed me. But um, I do know that the first part is available over on Floatplane, so I don't know when it will make it to YouTube. I like some were saying, "Oh, yeah, it'll be out." tomorrow but like obviously it's not out tomorrow because that was like three or four days ago um but it's probably gonna be out within seven days of it coming out on um on on on, on float plane and i am i am i am certainly excited for that because i will i will for sure be uh be talking about this why the hell okay i'll get into that in a bit um because judging by what I've heard from Linus, Linus has had a pretty jank experience, uh, not helped by the fact that he picked Manjaro, and, well, Manjaro is not the best. I know, I, I know someone's going to say, I picked Manjaro as my first distro, and it was great. Fine, that's good. But I would not ever recommend Manjaro for a new user. A rolling release is always going to give you a lot more trouble than it's really worth. But... Um, a lot of Linus's setup is weird. Yeah, a lot of a lot of what he's doing is really weird, uh, and that's that's not helping out. But the reason why I don't consider that to be a fault on Linus's part is because you're not like I wouldn't expect anyone to go and you know update their entire setup just to use Linux. Like, that's, the, that's completely ridiculous. If you're going to switch to Linux, you're going to switch with what you currently have. This is why people ask, oh, how do, I, uh, how do I switch to Linux using my Mac? Like, this is why people ask that, because they have a Mac. Not because they went out of their way to buy a Mac to put, Windows, uh, to put, uh, to put Linux on it. They, they, they just want to use what they have. And that, that's why. Um, but as for Luke, Luke sounds like he's had a, a much, what's the best way to put it? Much more normal experience, I guess, is a good way to put it. Like, Luke's experience, from what I've heard, has basically just been the general Linux experience, where you install Linux, and it just, it just basically works, and that's pretty much it. Like, that... He doesn't like he's had problems with some like random programs where the developers have been fucking lazy, where there's been a massive lag problem uh when you move the window and the bug has been uh, reported like 8 years ago. Things like that where the developers just don't really deem this obvious essential fix for a program actually essential and never bother to fix it while working on a bunch of other more fun stuff where you can add, you know, more features to the application. Um, this was something wrong with, uh, with Cinnamon, I believe. Yeah. Uh, Ransom was telling me about it during the live stream. Um, but besides that, like that, actually, no, not besides that. That's part of it. Uh, Luke's basically had the general Linux experience. Like, it works, some shit's broken, some devs don't fix shit that's broken for 10 years. Uh, and that's pretty much how it goes. But, you know, gaming, setting stuff up. 
everything else works basically as it should. I've actually had, ever since I started talking about uh, more about Linux gaming, I keep getting these comments from people telling me how bad Linux gaming is. Telling me, oh, it doesn't work, or... Oh, it's so laggy. It's so impossible to play. Like, oh, Linux gaming is so bad. I don't think they realize that when I talk about the Steam Deck, I'm talking about it from the perspective of someone who already plays games on Linux. The reason why I want a Steam Deck is because I know how well the Steam Deck is going to work. I know the problems it's going to have. I know how to address them because the problems it's going to have outside of like specific hardware issues are going to be problems that are faced by Linux gaming. And yeah, I, 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 I sort of just, I know what I'm getting into. I actually had someone at work, uh, just out of the blue, ask me about the, uh, out, about the Steam Deck. Like, oh, are you considering getting one? Like, I, I didn't expect just random people like that to start asking me about it, but he wants to get one. Um, the problem is, you know, pre-orders in Australia and wait lists and chip shortages and all of this mess. So he'll settle for his uh, 6800 that he paid $1,800 for. Because fucking GPUs are insane right now. Anyway, the thing that got me distracted before is uh, this post right here. So... XFC can be run on Wayland by simply swapping out the XFWM window manager free Wayland compositor. And people keep talking about this. Like, this keeps being like near the top of r slash Linux. It's been there for like the, what, past four days. Like since it came, since this post was made. Yes. Yes. If you swap out the part that doesn't run on Wayland with a part that runs on Wayland, it runs on Wayland. Okay, like I, I, I don't know why. I don't know why people keep bringing this. Oh, why, why just keep sitting at the top? It's very, very, very obvious. Wait, link to how to do it. I want to try it out. This is my screenshot. It's from my friend. What's in the post? The link. All the information he gave me, I asked him for a detailed process of how he did it, and he said he'd write it out for me later. It seems like he never wrote it out for you later, judging by the fact that I don't see a link to it. <laughs> but yeah, all you would do is just swap out the compositor for a compositor. Yes, that's how that works. <laughs> like, you can do this on any desktop environment. You can do it on Cinnamon, you can do it on Gnome. Actually, well, Gnome already runs on Wayland, but like, you could swap out... Um, Mutter, yes, that one, for a different compositor, and it will work. It will be a pain in the ass, but you can do it. You can do it on Cinnamon, other other desktop environments that exist. Like, this is not, like, a, a new crazy concept. It's just that the desktop environment does, uh, developers don't really talk about it because most people aren't going to, you know, actually do it. But it's, like, a desktop environment isn't some magical thing. I know that it's it's packaged together as like a single application, but a desktop environment isn't a single application. A desktop environment is the exact same thing as a window manager rice. It's just in a package. Like that's all it is. So obviously you can replace parts of the package and it works just fine. Obviously some of them are more tightly coupled than others, GNOME being one great example of this. But even in that case, you can swap shit out and it'll still be fine. It's just not going to like you doing that sometimes. Yeah. Anyway, um, I saw this other post that I want to talk about. I don't know what the hell it's about. A new operating system kernel with Linux binary compatibility written in Rust. Um, it's arguable this is a derivative work of the Linux kernel, hence the permissive licensing is already inappropriate. Yeah, okay, let's... Haha, <laughs> System76 guy. Uh, yeah, we can laugh about the dumb shit that happened with Truth Social recently. Uh, a related project with microkernel design is Redox. Now, I actually don't know anything about this project. I just saw the post and have been um, meaning to be meaning to talk about it. It's an interesting project, but I still prefer all my software written in C with small bits of higher level languages mixed in. 
This is the sort of person who has... Actually, I'm not even showing it to you. This right here is the sort of person who shows up in YouTube comments telling you about how bad Rust is, telling you about how bad X language is, but has never actually written a line of code in their entire life. Like, I don't understand this argument. If you think that C is objectively the best language, you just don't know what you're talking about. But yeah, this is a, 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 a kernel operating system, yes, with Linux kernel support. I actually should go and try this out in a... Supports QEMU. I should go and run this in QEMU and see what it's what it's what it's like see if there's any reason it, obviously you probably shouldn't go and use it um just go and use linux but seeing if the project's actually you know functional can't wait for neofetch support if you ran neofetch in it a uh, neofetch in it it probably would just report it as like a generic linux project i would say um yeah, actually, yeah, I need to look more into this and just see what it's all about. Uh, does writing in, in Rust have a benefit other, in some way over alternative languages of existing code? Wait, here we go. Here, here, do, we, do we have a Rust shill here? The main advantage of Rust is that you can get to accelerate global... Glo you can accelerate global warming every time you hit compile as you sit back... Okay, so this... No, this is not a, uh, a Rust shill. Uh, this is an anti-Rust shill, a Rust hater. As you sit back for hours and watch cargo inefficiently go through all the crate, uh, crates down the dependency tree, the CPU fan crescendos into a jet engine, the coil wind purrs at a higher and higher pitch, and at this time, what you see, uh, that you see the truth that with Rust, you can finally satisfy your computer. With Rust, you can finally keep your computer at this dangerously high level of arousal, 20, 40, or 60 minutes, even with simple programs. Have you ever compiled anything written in Rust. Uh, gone is the shame with your pathetic one-minute compiles with C. Now you're a real developer and satisfy your computer in a way it deserves. There's, uh, there's also something about memory safety, but that's really just an insignificant side effect to the glorious house and abilities of Rust. Obviously, that's a joke, but like, there's actually people who have this take on Rust. <laughs> it's like Rust is just inherently bad, um, and you should never use Rust. Like, I don't... I don't actually understand the hate for Rust. Like, it seems like the hate for Rust only comes from people who are not developers. Which, you know, makes sense. Because if you were a developer, you would just see it as a tool. Like, if you are, you know, let's say you're a mechanic. You don't see, like, I don't know, a fucking, a, a certain brand of tools as the enemy. You don't see a fucking wrench and think, no, that wrench, that's a bad wrench. No one should use that wrench. That's a wrench that's going to destroy the world. But the way people look at Rust, it basically is like that, where... <coughs> like, people actually think it's just this, like, horrible thing that's going to destroy everything. Oh, no, if there's... If there's rust in the Linux kernel, it's going to take years to compile. Things like this. Which is just not true. At all. F I fucking called it. I fucking called it. People told me I was wrong. And I fucking called it. Is this actually Adobe doing this? Oh, wait, the, uh, uh, apparently they did. This is just a write-up about the beta. Adobe, uh, I, sorry, uh, any audio listeners have no idea what I'm talking about right now. Uh, Adobe showed Photoshop web. Um, so, uh, Adobe brings a web version of Photoshop. Right now, it is a simplified version but I will be very, very surprised if it stays as a simplified version. I will be very surprised if they don't get the entirety of Photoshop actually working in the web. Apparently, Il uh, Illustrator also works. Um, yeah. Like, obviously, this is a very simplified version of uh, Illustrator here, but I fucking called it. 
I told you that Adobe was going to make a web version. I told you it was going to happen because that's the direction development is going. People keep telling me, oh, but no, it's not di the direction the development's going. Oh, and shut up. You have no idea what you're talking about. I called this, and I'm fucking right, and I'll take my victory. Even though this is a uh, a minimal version of it at this stage, I presume it's a minimal, a minimal version because, you know, making a minimal version makes it much easier to do a beta. But... The like it's not like it's not like um Adobe doesn't want to sell copies of Photoshop to Linux users. It's just that they're not gonna go out of their way to support Linux users. But do you know what you can do with a web version? Well, now you have a now you have a version that will run on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux with no extra development. I am fucking certain that this is a beta that is going to be the new direction of Photoshop. They are going to, over time, migrate Photoshop over to be a fully web client, and the desktop app, like the desktop app for something like Google Drive, is basically just going to be a container for the website. And I guarantee I'm right. People can tell me I'm wrong, but call me in five years when I'm right. Call me in five years where more and more applications keep doing this because that's just the way it's going to go. It's much cheaper to develop like this. Plus, the other advantage of doing it, like having a web version like this is mobile because you can just detect, oh yeah, okay, we're on a mobile. We're going to keep using the same website, but we'll use a minified version of the tool set because obviously you don't need all the tools on mobile. And Or maybe you're on tablet, for example, and you want to have more of the tools. Then you bring in more of the tools. And yeah, that's 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 why that's gonna happen. That uh that sort of just came out of nowhere, but I I I, I had to talk I didn't have that one planned. Uh, I just saw a post and had to talk about that because you know I I I I am I'm happy to be proven right. I'm happy to be proven right, even though it may take a while. Because we've already, like, there's already a, a project that demonstrates that web-based Photoshop actually is possible. It's called Photopea. Like, this has existed for a long-ass time. Um, Photopea is a, it's a web clone of Photoshop. Like, you, there's already a project that demonstrates that Photoshop in the web is entirely possible. So it was only a matter of time until Adobe actually does it themselves and maybe tries to sue the ever-loving shit out of Photopea. Um, they'll probably end up having to do a redesign or something like that, but yeah. I called it. And I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm evidently happy about it. Now, things I'm... Happy about? Not happy about. I am amused by, we'll say. Um, I did a video, uh, I guess it'd be like a week ago for you guys, about a hacker. Uh, here we go. Here we go. About a hacker in uh, Missouri. So, viewing website HTML is not illegal or hacking, Professor tells Missouri governor. Um... So, what ended up happening here... Actually, no, this is the professor that was in the original article. I thought it was a new professor. Um, so, what happened here is the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in Missouri, uh, their website had a tool where you could go and look up a, a teacher in the, in the state and look up, like, what their certifications and what their qualifications were and, you know, see if you want that person to be the teacher for your student, you can sort of judge the value of a school based on the quality of their teachers. Like, that, a perfectly good tool. I know that's a thing people do more in the US where they, like, look around for schools. In Australia, you usually just go to whatever one is closest, but fine. That's cool. Um, now, this tool had a bug where, not a bug, this tool had a moron that designed it who decided to store... Uh, social security numbers in the HTML. Now, for obvious reasons, that's dumb. 
But a journalist at the Post-Dispatch thought, I'm going to do some journalism today, went and checked out the website, and they discovered that, yeah, that's in there. They press F12 and looked at the source code and looked, oh, it's there. Not, a, not really source code. It's more like they looked at the HTML markup. So they saw that and went and reported the bug to the DESC, and that was pretty much that. Then the DESC decided, oh, we don't actually care. We're going to shoot the messenger. We are going to pretend like this vulnerability doesn't exist, and we're going to pretend like we were actually hacked. Now, following that, the dumbest governor in the entire world... Uh, I mean, not the entire world. The dumbest governor in Missouri. Yep, there we go. <laughs> the dumbest governor in Missouri decided to go on to... Um, decided to go on to onto his Facebook, do a live stream, and basically said, we were hacked. We were hacked. Someone looked at the, the source code for our website. They decoded and decrypted and whatever other bullshit they were saying and stole these records, which never happened because that's ridiculous. Um... But he seems like he's still doubling down on it. He's going to be running a investigation, uh, a $50 million investigation into whether looking at a website and clicking on inspect element is hacking. This old man unironically thinks that if you press inspect element, you're hacking a website. No. No. That's not how that works. If you send plain text to my computer and I look at that plain text, I did not hack anything. I just looked at the text. If you have a fucking billboard outside outside your office that says, hey, this is what your home address is and what your home phone number is, I didn't hack you to find that information. You put it on a fucking billboard. That's basically the state we're in. Um, and obviously, everyone is just mocking the hell out of this governor because it's the dumbest story. Uh, the only people that aren't mocking the governor um, are people who are like, this is, a, this is a deep state attack on the Republicans. This is... Be, the Republicans are being attacked and this is bad. That, 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 like, those people are the only people who are, like, who are, like, not understanding that this governor is just an idiot and has no idea what he's talking about. But the thing is, it's okay for the governor to be an idiot. Now, that might not sound like a, you know, you, you probably want your, your governors to know exactly what's happening. But, okay, this is why every politician has an advisor. They always have advisors. They hire these people that know shit that they don't know. And that's what, you know... He's supposed to have. He's supposed to have someone there that understands tech stuff, but he decided instead to just basically be a uh, a mouthpiece for the DSC without going and actually verifying any of this information. Because oh yeah, the ver the DSC clearly can't be telling me anything that's complete bullshit. They they absolutely have to be telling the truth. Um, no, either that the DSC. I don't know if the DSC is lying directly to his face, or if they are also just as stupid and don't know what's going on either. But I didn't expect this story to still be floating around. So this story was about a week old, and there are still new news articles being made about it. <laughs> oh my god. I... There's no world where this gets... gets like, properly investigated. Any investigator that understands the basic of technology is going to say, no, like, go away. Like, just throw this out straight away. But then, you know, it's going to be more of the deep state. The deep state. <laughs> uh... Oh, St. Louis Dispatch has a new article. I don't know. I don't want to... I don't care about your stupid sign-up. Parson team notes GOP lawmakers call response to Missouri's... Oh, this is something different. Okay. Ignore me. Um... 
This is a dumb story. And I, I love it. Oh, God. Um, speaking of things that are dumb, I'll see if I can find information about this. So I was at work last night, and my sister sent me a message. Uh, where is it? Can we find information about it? Uh, yes, here we go. No, I don't want to fucking read. I, no, I'm not paying for the Australian. Go away. Um, so my sister sent me a message. She was like, oh yeah, here's a, uh, here's a thing that I feel like you need to know about because it's fucking hilarious. Um, digital horse racing. Now, I don't mean digital horse racing as in, you know, your the, the horses are racing and you're making bets online. No, 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 no. That's that's completely normal. Oh my god, it's live streaming on Twitch right now. Oh my fucking god. So, what I mean is digital horse racing. Digital horses racing and you bet on the digital horses. I... I... I don't have words for how dumb this is. I don't have words for how stupid you have to be to bet on a digital horse. The future of digital racehorse ownership is here. There shouldn't be a future. There shouldn't be a present. There should be a nun. Race your way to the top and build your legacy today. Um, so you can buy, you can buy horses, um, you can buy horses and you might notice that right there, it's connecting with MetaMask, you know why it's connecting with MetaMask? Because crypto. <sighs> Are these... I, are these NFT horses? I have a feeling they're NFT horses. Um, provably fair. Provably fair. Provably fair. This. Provably fair. That's a fun. Yeah. You okay? You're buying crypto horses as well. So yeah, they're they're NFT horses. Um, provably. F how, tell me how. Tell me how. Tell me how a digital... Di how, tell me how digital horse racing is provably fair. Tell me how a... <laughs> tell me how that is the case. Yeah, it's an NFT horse game. Um, I, of course, it's fucking NFTs. Um, so yeah, you, you buy NFT horses and you race the NFT horses. If we need a use case for NFTs, here's a use case. And it's fucking ridiculous. Um, I hope that every- I'm not saying that Zed Run is a scam. I hope that a scam platform shows up and takes you for all of your money. If you are stupid enough to bet on bits in a computer racing each other. Now, you might say, oh, but what about eSports? eSports is bits in a computer battling each other. No. Esports is where you have actual people controlling a video game. Um. No. Stop. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. We don't. We don't. We don't fucking need digital horse racing. We've gone too far. We need to go back. We, Marty, let's, we need to fucking go back. Get in the fucking car. We're going back in time. Oh. The past couple of years have gotten ridiculous with NFTs. Ugh. Hey, but uh, look, I'll give you the fact that this is the first NFT project that has a use case and isn't just, hey, buy my stupid JPEG. I'll give you that. This is a use case. It's a dumb one, but it's a use case. Now let's drop all of this and find a productive use case. Please. Please. I really, really want one. 
I'm going to actually go post this in my Discord just because I want to see people laugh about it. Um, here we go. Post this here. Huh? There we go. Uh, NFT horse racing. There we go. Um, fucking hell. I want to talk about something that's not going to make me as annoyed as fucking NFT horse racing. Um, let's talk about, uh, GTA ASM San Andreas Unity. Someone is re-implementing GTA San Andreas, but inside of Unity. And it looks pretty cool. Um... They're completely remaking the ground, uh, the game from the ground up with the same story, ga same mechanics, all of that fun stuff. Obviously, it's very early on, um, but I'm making Unity 2018. Why did they pick? I guess they probably started the project back in 2018. That makes sense. But it's cl clearly come a long way. Um, I I only just heard about this, but it looks yeah, it's been a project for three years. Wow. Um, and obviously, back three years ago, it wasn't, you know, <laughs> it wasn't in a great state. Um, but they've, uh, got NPCs now. Ooh, that's fancy. Look at this. There's people walking around the world. And there's more people in this game than there is in Cyberpunk. <laughs> uh... It looks jank as hell, but to be fair, so did uh, so did the original San Andreas. Uh, it looks like they've imported the map. I don't think they've remade the map. That would be, honestly, three years of work by itself for one person to do. Um, and I know there are ways to export maps from a lot of games, so they probably just straight up exported the uh, the models from that. That car was not solid, was it? Yeah, that car was not solid. Um, but it's cool. I, uh, I'm i going to keep an eye on this project to see what it's like. And wouldn't it be funny if this ended up just being better than the version that Rockstar's making themselves? <laughs> it kind of would be funny if that was the case. Uh, and But honestly, what's probably going to happen is... Wow, there's actually combat that works properly. Uh, what's probably going to happen is... They're at some point going to get sued by Rockstar. Because Rockstar really does not like fan projects. They're fine with modding. But when you do like decompilation projects or things like that. Yeah. Rockstar. Rockstar is very. um Very. Ban. Ban hammery. But. It is open source, so, you know, it's, it's, gonna, it's always going to go backed up. Um, it is important to note that this is not based on the San Andreas decompilation project. As I said, this is a rewrite in Unity. Um, so, hopefully they don't have as much of a problem with it as they did with uh, with the decompilation and the uh, the third-party engines like um, like some of the other projects had. But Rockstar will be Rockstar, and we will see what they do. Mm -mm -mm. Actually, something I saw... I didn't, was it this morning? Yeah, it was this morning. So, I mentioned before that I watch a lot of um, Josh Strife Hayes, a MMO YouTuber. And he did a video about New World, and how New World is a very busted game. So... I'm not going to show you the ad because I refuse to show that. Um, so, New World is a game. New World is an MMO. Specifically, specifically an MMO. That's what's very important here. Now, in an MMO, the thing you don't do is validate anything of value on the client side. What you validate on the client side are things that only matter to the client. So, things like your HUD layout, your your graphical settings, um, I don't know, your uh, other things that are, I don't know, your, your controls, there we go, there's another one. Things that only affect the user 
and things that aren't yeah, things that only affect the user and things that are inconsequential to if they do affect other players are inconsequential to other players. So for example, in uh Final Fantasy 14, you can go and disable your helmet being visible. And that's fine. That's completely inconsequential to other players and really does not matter. Um, that is done on the server anyway, but like if it was done on the client and validated like that, it wouldn't be a big deal. What you don't do is um validate damage and validate trades on the client. So New World are also validating player location. So New World. Um should we go to this next yeah, when this next one plays, that's that's the big one. So this person is suspending themselves in air right now and slowly falling. Uh because the game the way that it determines where your location is, uh, if the client cannot send that information, the server does not receive a any information about it. So even in cases where the client, or even in cases where the server should be able to handle it perfectly fine itself, for example, you are falling. There is no input that needs to be made from the client there. If no input is being made from the client, the server should assume that you just continue to fall. Obviously, there are things that you might want to be able to adjust in the air, for example, like you might be able to move in the air, things like that. But you shouldn't be suspended in midair. The server should be able to calculate that there is a an entity in the air and that entity should remain falling. But it doesn't do that. It also doesn't do that with damage. So <laughs> if you so if you roll, th this game has a rolling mechanic, and rolls have iframes. Now the way... Oh, the cat's in here. Why is my cat in here? How did the cat get in here? Give me one second. Um, Come on. Come on, kitty. Come on. Here you go. I wonder where it disappeared to earlier. Somehow it was under my bed. Anyway. um, <laughs> I'm not cutting that. So, when you take damage... Oh, sorry, iframes. Iframes is what I was saying. Uh, actually, we'll start with damage. Damage is a, a better one, then we can go into the iframes. So, when you take damage, um, if you... <laughs> what happens is if you have the game in windowed mode, or when you're in air, if you have the game in windowed mode, any time you have the game in windowed mode, if you move the window, the game basically thinks that you are logged off. Um, which is a problem. So, if you're in combat, and you have an enemy attacking you, as the enemy attacks you, it'll be attacking you, like, the, the enemy attacks are being handled on the server. Um, so, when you stop moving the client, basically it's going to stack up a bunch of damage. And you might just instantly die if you're moving the client. And that's fine. It shouldn't be working like that, but that's fine. Um... Where this can get abused, though, is in the case of uh, dodge rolling. So dodge rolling has iframes. Now, the game determines whether... or the Sorry, the server determines whether you are rolling based on what the client has said. So if you hit the roll key, um, it the, the client is going to say to the server, I have started rolling, engage iframes. Okay. Then when you end the roll... This, the client will say to the server again, I have ended the roll, disable the iframes. Now, what's going to happen if you suspend the game in the middle of that segment? So, after the roll has started, but before it has ended, well, the game doesn't know what to do. And because you're invincible, um, the enemies just don't attack you. you they just don't. They, they can't hurt you, they just don't attack you. And this can be abused in other ways as well. Um, for example, if you are trading trading items and you trade the item, and then when the trade has finished but before it has, you know, confirmed from the system, you move the window and then you kill the window. Uh, you dupe the item. Now, I don't know if this one has been patched. Um, there is some of this stuff that has been 
that was patched a couple of days ago, and uh, some of the information is slightly uh, slightly out of date, but uh, I'm pretty sure that one still is the case. Now, because this information is being verified by the client, that means there is likely a lot of other stuff that can be completely broken. If the client has this much control over what is happening on the server, that likely means that you can manipulate things like money values and health values through something like Cheat Engine, for example. Um, I don't know of any cases of this actually occurring, but if this information is being verified, or being... If, yeah, this information is being verified on the client, it's very likely that these values can be manipulated in a in a way to give the player an unfair advantage. Um, so what we have here basically is a we have a client a client side authoritative model. And when you design a, when you design a system like this, it's not designed like this as a bug or as an accident, anything like that. The reason why New World is designed the way it is, is entirely intentional. Designing your game like this by accident would be like designing a peer-to-peer -peer system when you meant to have client server. It does not happen. The reason why stuff is being validated like this on the client is probably because it's easier. So New World... New World got delayed once, and I really feel like Amazon Game Studios did not want to delay it again, because that would, you know, slow down the hype and probably wouldn't be as big of a launch, so it's very likely that during those last couple of months, when the devs were in massive crunch time, they just decided, you know what, the only way we're going to get this game out of the door is by doing stuff like this on the client side. And that's that's sort of what's happened here. From now, I don't know the specific architecture of uh, New World. It's very possible that I might be mistaken. But from my my personal experience with client server models, and my 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 extensive digging into software of various kinds, I don't think this is a we patch the game and it is fixed thing. This is like, this is a fucking Realm Reborn level of we burn the game to the ground and we start again. Because this would require a fundamental rewrite of the way that they are actually validating combat, of the way they are handling trade, of the basics of their netcode. I don't think this is something you can just easily patch. Obviously, you can patch it. Like any, like some will say, "Oh, these are things. This is something you can't patch out of the game." Obviously, anything you've written in code can be patched. But this isn't like a, you know, a simple one week or something patch. This is a we shut the game servers down for three months and we f we just fix the game. We we like. Fucking Realm Reborn this shit and start from the ground up. It is kind of sad because New World's been getting a lot of shit recently because I guess it was really overhyped. People wanted a, a new MMO experience. They wanted something big. They wanted something exciting. And it was and from what I saw, it was exciting early on. You know, it was this fun world that people wanted to explore, but then people started realizing, you know, it felt very corporate. Um, Josh also talked about how uh, a lot of the cities are literally carbon copies of each other rotated. Like, the maps are the same. And stuff like this really gets really starts to get on, on people's nerves. Plus, from what I know, there's not really much endgame content at this point. Um, if you're not doing PvP, there's really no endgame in this game. Take I'm going to talk about Final Fantasy because it's a great example of this. Take Final Fantasy, for example. Final Fantasy has raid content. It has player-driven content because the game's been around for a very long time. It has 
fucking glamours. It has you can be our bard and just fucking hold consent in uh, concerts in in Limsa Laminza. Like there is a lot of content there for different styles of players. From what I can see with New World, the only content it has is like obviously it has some end game raids, but because it's still a fairly new game and doesn't have any expansions yet, it's still very limited compared to other games that have been around for. 10 so years. Like, take RuneScape, take WoW, take... You can argue the quality of it, but take Final Fantasy, take Adventure Quest Worlds, for example. Anything that's been around for a while, obviously, is going to have time to build up that content. But that's not what people expect. What people expect is they expect a game. Like, it, it's this sort of weird position any developer has to be in, uh, especially for an MMO like this, where... People don't just want to finish the game. They want to keep playing it. So there's always going to be this expectation for more and more content. And if your game just comes out and doesn't have the level of content that a game that's been out for 10 years already has, it's going to feel like it's not worth your time compared to those other experiences. But I feel bad for anyone who's, you know, who got really excited by New World and has sort of been burnt out by it early on. I I expect the game to stick around for a, a long time. I just don't know if it's going to be... I don't know what its future is. That's that's what I'm saying. With this massive netcode problem, that's honestly like going to put a lot of people off of the game, just off trying it all together. I don't... I don't know what its future is. I will be watching Josh's video, seeing what he has to say about it, but I don't know what the future is. And yeah, that's that's pretty much that's pretty much it on that. Um, what else should we go on here? Oh yeah, this is like a short story, but literally everything is news right now. Like when there's when there's nothing happening, everything is news. So I went to the Verge. I always go to the Verge and other news sites to get topics for the uh the the podcast. And the news is. The new 14-inch MacBook Pro is already $50 off at Amazon. How expensive is this device? Oh, it's... <laughs> Instead of $2,000, you can pay $19.49.99. Oh, my. Do you know why they, they, they did this? Do you know why? Because they realized The Verge would write a fucking article about it. About literally nothing. Like, it's not a $100 drop. It's not a $200 drop. It's not even, like, I don't know, a funny haha meme number, like $69. It's $50. It's $50. $50 off of a $2,000 computer. It's not a fucking story. And now I'm here talking about it as if, like, it is a story. It's not a story. Somehow they managed to write... How many words do we have? Oh, they padded the article out by talking about things that are not the new MacBook. Why is there a... Wait, why the fuck is there a... Oh, this is their good deals thing. That's not a good deal. What do you mean it's a good deal? It's $50 off. That's not a good deal. It's a deal. It is slightly less than it would have cost before. But it's not a good deal. Like, just go away. Mm. Um. Actually, here's something I want to talk about. So, this is something that sort of... Got on my skin a little bit. Um, recently, I... Actually, I need to change over to my main channel so I can see it. Recently, I did a video about a program called Annie CLI. Annie CLI basically connects to GoGo Anime PE. I don't remember what the fucking website was called. It connects to, like, an anime piracy website, and you, you can use it to stream anime. Now, obviously you probably should be supporting the content that you actually enjoy, and I, you know, I, I highly suggest doing that. Now, I don't particularly care in my case about pirating anime. Now, that's not because I I don't want to support the anime industry or anything like that. Not at all. Um, it's because of the way that I choose to support the industry. I don't... I don't want to support companies like Crunchyroll or Funimation or actually they're all being merged together at this point by Sony. I refuse to, to support companies that waste their money 
on projects like High Guardian Spice. I, if I'm going to be using a streaming service like that, I want the overhead of the company to be as little as possible so that the vast majority of that money goes to support the industry. I don't want a, you know, a, a company that's going to make their cut as, or make the, uh, the, the industry's cut as small as possible so they can line their pockets as much as possible. That is not the way that I want to support the industry. So I don't really care about pirating anime in my case because I support the industry in a completely different way. Do you know how I support stuff? I buy source material. I buy merch. I buy things that are going to send far more money into the industry than any like any number of years is going to for what uh, for using uh for a crunchy roll or Funimation or anything like that. So I've talked about like my my ownership of light novels. I haven't talked about, you know, how much I own. This isn't me trying to like moral grandstand saying, "Oh, I think that you're a bad person if you stream, uh, if you use like Crunchyroll or Funimation. If that's how you want to support the industry, that's fine. I actually think that's great. If that's the, if you choose to use those those companies and support the industry like that, then that, go ahead. That's fine. I don't want to support them though, and that's my choice. But anyway, my number of light novels. I don't actually know how many I have. Um, okay, let's, let's estimate one shelf worth. So, one, two, three, four, I can just, actually, because they're numbered, I can just count the sets, can't I? Uh, so two, eight, 11, 14, 19, uh, what does that take us up to? 27, something like that. So, three shelves of that, I'll put us around, what, like, 80 or 90 light novels, I would say. Uh, and each of those are about 15 to $20 each. So let's put that around... We'll, put it, we'll go on the low end, say 15 Um So just from my light novels and nothing else, I've probably spent close to $1,400. Some of them are a bit more than $15, but let's just say... Let's just round it to $1,500. Don't fucking tell me that... Okay, here's the comment in question. So, don't fucking tell me that I'm not supporting the industry. Let's be clear. Using such services is illegal. And by pointing this out, you're an accessory to that fact. Buying merch doesn't negate the acts of privacy you have committed in downloading such anime illegally or the fact that it was uploaded illegally. If you had never mentioned the, the legality of this, I wouldn't have cared. But if, uh, but you did and you were clearly wrong and knew it. Now don't fucking tell me that I don't, I don't care about supporting the industry. Don't fucking tell me that because I buy light novels and I buy merch that somehow that 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 doesn't support the industry. That's ridiculous. I have put more money into the anime industry than most people would from, what, 10 years of using Crunchyroll. I do not feel like I have some, like, moral deficit or I am somehow a bad person because I don't support the anime industry the way that you want me to. I don't actually give a shit. And no, you know, I, I do give a shit. I give a shit because people... Like, this is fucking dumb, right? The anime industry in the West began from anime piracy. To have this, like, moral high horse about, oh, anime piracy is bad. Like, that's fine if you, you know, you want to go and use the streaming service. That's fine. But there's, like, the industry in the West started from piracy and, like, people from that early point, we're supporting the industry through merch. Like, to pretend like that doesn't, that never happened, is ridiculous. And I don't care that you want me to support it through streaming. I'm going to support it the way I want to support it, and I'm going to continue doing that. You don't have to do it like that. That's fine. I don't care. But I'm going to. I'm going to keep buying light novels. I'm going to keep buying figures. Actually, on figures. So I probably got... What? Mm, like, another $600 of figures? Like, 
Fuck off, basically. I'm supporting the industry the way that I want to. I've supported it more than you will in, like, 20 years. So, fuck off, <laughs> basically. <laughs> that, that's pretty much what I have to say about that. Just, I don't feel bad about pirating anime. I, 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 I don't. I, I, I think I've, I, I've certainly paid, I've certainly paid my, uh, paid my dues, is a, is, is a, a, a way to put it. Dues with a D, not, you know, you know what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> do, I paid my dues if, if, uh, if that's the way you want to pronounce. In Australia, we don't actually differentiate the words, they're just, whatever. Enough of that dumb topic, I'm not going to spend time talking about the, the pronunciation of dues and dues. <laughs> Anyway, um, I have supported the industry the way I want to, and I'm going to keep doing that. So, go away. <laughs> Basically, it has gotten really hot in this room. Um, there was a thunderstorm this morning, and I guess because of that, it's really, really humid. Uh, I, I guess not hot. That's not a, that's not the best way to put it. I'm going to open up a window. Um, I'm going to, I was going to bring you guys with me, but my microphone came out of the slot. Um, so I'm going to bring the mic as close as I can to me so I can keep talking and give this some breeze in this room. That's not better. <laughs> That's not better at all. I thought there might have been a breeze outside, but nope, there's not. So it's still fucking warm in here. Um, but hopefully it will cool down now that that's open. Um, probably by the time I finish the podcast. <laughs> oh, my... Thing for my chair so it doesn't fall back came out and I just fell back. Uh <laughs> my dog playing with a toy outside. Um <coughs> mm. Yeah, that's where I stand on anime piracy, so go away. Um What do we have any on here? Do we have any words? Um I won't really have anything else that exciting on here, do we? Um Oh, actually, that's, that is one thing. I don't remember if I talked about this, but I recently found out that you can force um, Fidelity Super Resolution, the uh, the AMD upsampling thing, through Proton, through using um, Proton GE. Um, you just do it with like a single option. There's an option to configure it. It's a bit j more jank than a game that natively supports it, but it is there, and that's good. So I was just trying it out to see sort of what it would be like, and it actually is fairly impressive, to be honest. I don't think at 1080p it really makes any sense. I know some people have said for some games, you know, it, it, it does work well, but I went from 720 up to 1080, and I felt like, even though it's not horrible, and it's much, much better than playing native 720, that's for goddamn sure, it's not a great experience. Maybe on 4K it would be different because, you know, 1080p is perfectly fine to play games on, and then going above that is going to give you a better experience, but it's not going to be as, you know, groundbreaking as 1080p and 720, or even, you know, lower than that. Um, but, but what was I saying? Right, uh, words. It works really well. That that's what I'm getting at here. I would recommend testing it out. Um, a, a couple of people have done videos on it already. It's pretty easy to enable. It's basically just like a launch option inside of um, inside of pro uh, inside of like your your Proton GE launch nonsense. And once you've done that, then uh, yeah, you're pretty much good to go. One thing you do have to do is actually manually lower the resolution in the game. So the way that it determines what resolution to upscale from is the current resolution of the game. So if you run the game at 1080 and you turn on FSR, it's not going to do anything. If you lower the resolution down to 1280 by 720 or anything else like that, then it will upscale it properly and you know work the way that you would expect it to work. This is a quirk of it being uh, not native. Uh, I, I presume there's going to be ways to for it to be improved over time, but as it stands, it's not really... It, 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 as it stands, it's sort of a bit jank to get it working, but one thing it will be interesting on is on the Steam Deck, because 
while it's a bit of a mess on a 27 inch, yeah 27 inch monitor on a 7 inch monitor i think that's going to be a very very different story i don't think anyone's tested effort like there's like uh, i know there's a chinese game dev who's been uploading um steam deck videos recently because uh, they got like a, a, a dev kit that one um, I don't think they've done anything with FSR. It seems like they're just, you know, testing games just to see what games are going to work and not doing stuff from the Linux perspective where you're, you know, messing around with stuff like that and sort of, you know, trying to see how you can break it and see seeing what you can push and stuff like that. It seems like they're just saying, hey, look, games work and here's what you can do. So it's going to be until um, someone actually gets their hands on it, someone... I don't have one on pre-order, but someone like a Mudahar or someone like that who's actually going to try to mess around with more stuff like that and sort of seeing what seeing what you can actually do with it. Because at 7 inches, I don't think you'd really notice it being upscaled. But what you would notice is a frame rate going from 45, 43, whatever FPS it's running at, to 60. That you will notice. And I think in cases where games run, but they don't run as well as you would like, you probably could get away with FSR. And I'm... When I eventually get one, I... Or maybe I'll just buy a really cheap... A really small monitor. That's an option. Um, <laughs> maybe turn my phone... Find, like, a 7-inch monitor. Or find a way to, like, turn my phone into, like, an external display. I know there were devices you could do that with in the past. I don't know if you can still do that with modern phones. Maybe I'll just go and buy an old phone. See if I can do it like that. Building... Building a Steam... Building a... Building a third-party Steam Deck. Tape a fucking phone. It basically would just be an NVIDIA Shield. Tape a phone. Um... Tape a phone to your 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 Xbox controller. Actually, something like NVIDIA Shield would have been really interesting if FSR existed back then. Because the problem with handheld gaming's back uh, handheld gaming systems back in the past is we didn't really have upscaling. Like we obviously upscaling existed, but game already upscaling. The early NVIDIA Shield probably would have gone completely differently if that was the case. And I think this is why. I think things like FSR and DLSS are the reason why handheld PC gaming is going to actually be viable in the years to come. Because now it's gotten to the point where, yeah, you you can play AAA games. Like, you can upscale them and not notice quality difference and play them perfectly fine. I am... I'm interested to see. Like, it... It may not be perfect, sure. And if you, like, have the fucking screen, you know... Don't turn on, fucking hell. Like, right in front of your face. Sure, you might notice... You might notice a couple of pixels, but... At a reasonable distance, at the distance you would actually, you know, use the device. It probably wouldn't be that big of a deal. <clears throat> and... I'm going to be excited for it. The other thing I'm excited for is for the new version of SteamOS to actually be released. Because, not because I think it's going to be that exciting. Like, people are talking about SteamOS as if it's going to be like this, oh, Valve's done so much crazy stuff with SteamOS. I really doubt I've done much. I, I have a feeling it's going to be Arch with delayed repos running KDE. That, I think, is going to be the extent of what they've done. Obviously, they're going to have their, like, custom drivers to make the little stick thing work, the... Uh, controllers work, um, but apart from that, I feel like it's going to be pretty bare bones arch, and that's a good thing. But I, I, I will be, I will be milking that for every, uh, every view it is worth. So expect to see that. Maybe I'll do both a live stream and also a video. I actually do have a plan in that regard. Um, for not for Steam OS, but for something different. So. I want to go and go back and try out um, Ubuntu Unity, which is a project Ubuntu Unity Remix. I think is that the name they go with, or is it just Ubuntu Unity now? I don't know. It's a project that basically ships Ubuntu running the old Unity desktop environment. 
basically like Ubuntu would have been back in whenever Ubuntu actually shipped with it, but now you're running like, you know, 21.04, 21.010, modern versions of Ubuntu. And I think that, that would be cool. Hmm. And I would, um, I would, I would love to try that out, and I, I, I will be. But when I, what I was saying, uh, I'm probably going to live stream it, like live stream my initial experience, and then later on make a more condensed video. I think, I think for a lot of projects like this, it actually makes a lot of sense. Um, I did that with my Gen two video. I did that with my LFS video. Is there anything else to do with? No, I think those are the only ones I've done so far. Oh, Emacs. Emacs is another one. Did I do an Emacs video? Or was it just a live stream? Fuck. I don't remember. Did I do an Emacs video? Wait, did I do an e I don't even know if I did an Emacs video. No, I just did the live stream. Um, But I'm probably going to go and run Ubuntu Unity in a live stream, get my initial thoughts about it, and then following that up, do a more condensed version where I can, yeah, I can sort of talk about it like that. It seems like a fun way to go about it, because a lot of people have their sort of like, their own, well, especially if there's users of that software in the live stream, they can be like, oh, here's a thing you can do, here's another thing you can do. Um... I'm a simple girl. I see a shirt with anime femboys on the video thumbnail. I click. I'm wearing a Yana's shirt. I'm wearing a fucking Yana's shirt in that thumbnail. What do you mean anime femboys? <laughs> Yana is an anime femboy. I have now discovered, according to YouTube. Um, <laughs> God... Um, what was I talking about? Anime fanboys? No, anime fanboys. What the fuck was I talking about? I got distracted by anime fanboys. Um, right, live streaming to test out projects. There's other things that I want to do the same thing with, like, uh, Void Linux, for example. That would be a great example, or Bedrock Linux. Uh, other of these, there's some other projects like this that I think really deserve live streams to do a more... Not in depth, more I guess long forms better way to put it. A long form content about it, and then following that up, doing the live, uh, doing the the video for the more condensed form, for you, so you can actually see like my my opinions not spread out across four hours. This is similar to what Mudahar actually does with his. He's done like some of his. What are they? The 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 dark web, the dark web. What was the series called that he hasn't done in a while? Dark web. Deep, dark, dark, what the fuck? The, something about the dark web. Where he's done some of them on live streams and then done more condensed thoughts in videos and um, other things like that. Where it, it, it's Other people have tried this setup before and I think the setup actually works really well. Uh, especially, especially in these cases where the community might have their own, in, you know, their own things they may want to add to, add to the stream. Maybe add that aren't really documented in the documentation provided by the project. So, like, I don't know, maybe hotkeys or something for Unity aren't as well documented as they could be. And there's some, like, hardcore Unity users in the, uh, in the live stream. And they can sort of guide me through some of those things that may not be as obvious. Because a lot of the time, I don't really like judging a project based on its documentation. I, I will bring up the documentation being an issue... Um, <clears throat> in many of those cases, but I don't like my holes in knowledge being left empty by the fact the documentation isn't great. I always try to find, I guess, supplementary, um, supplementary sources of that information in places where I, places where I actually can. Mm. Yeah. Also... Um, we're actually getting pretty close to the end of the podcast. We're actually like 10, 15, what, 15 minutes away, something like that. I don't know. We're probably not going to run out to the end. Um, I keep saying I'm going to do a shorter podcast and then not doing it. At some point it might happen. Oh yeah. Actually, one thing you might notice is that I have more energy. Um, that's because I had a holiday. 
I know it's crazy. Brody taking a holiday is fucking rare. Um, the other week, uh, after my Final Fantasy stream stream podcast, uh, I went to my parents' place. Basically, turned the internet off for the weekend. I didn't. I I think I think I turned my phone on once to look up the price of like I don't know some food or something, <laughs> or check my check. I had money in my bank account so I could pay for stuff. That's the only reason why I, I turned my phone on. Any other time, phone was off. And I got I got some good sleep. It was great. It was honestly great to finally get some good sleep. Um, also, I'm, I'm trying to adjust my... My... What's the word? My... Diet. That one. Um, eat better. Hopefully not die as much. Um, can't confirm anything. It's work in progress at this point. And... Yeah, I was supposed to go camping that weekend, but that didn't happen. I uh, we went camping for a day, and then mom was like, oh, I'm feeling sick, and we went home. Um, but I... I, I want to go... I want to actually go camping myself at some point. Like, it's been a long time since I've actually gone camping. Um, and I'll probably... I, I kind of want to just get the stuff to go solo camping at some point. Problem is, my current place is a little small, and I don't really have, um, you know places to store stuff so that's probably gonna wait until i i move to my new place and then probably have to wait until the following year and it warms up because it's gonna be in february or march when i move and it's gonna start cooling down it look at, at some point it's gonna happen um but this is gonna it's gonna it's gonna be a while away basically also um i i was doing a live stream earlier today i mentioned that before but as always, uh, as, as fairly commonly, Ren showed up in the live stream. Um, Ren, the guy I had on, on the podcast a couple of weeks back, the, uh, the VTuber. He also plays Final Fantasy XIV, and he was asking, he keeps, he every, every fucking second I mention Final Fantasy XIV, he'll show up be like, hey, bro, you want to you do, for, 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 do a live stream together? You want a live stream together? Um, so yeah, at some point, we're going to do a Final Fantasy live stream together. I don't know how it's going to work, um, because one of us will basically need to make an alt, uh, because you, I, th I thought you could, I honestly thought this was a thing you could do already, apparently you can't move between, um, you can't move between, blah, 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 move between regions, which is really dumb, uh, but it is going to be coming very soon, I don't know how it's taken this long, like, moving between regions is not a difficult process, uh, but, yeah, that's gonna be coming soon, so, uh, until then, we'll have to do a, a alt character. Um, but besides that, I'm not really sure how it's going to work, because if we go, you know, if we start off at level one, then we have to go through all the, the early game content, and I, I don't know how, unless we're already in the same region, I don't know how, how we could do a stream together that actually works out well. Um, but... We will think about it, and then at some point, I will probably do a stream with Ren of Final Fantasy. If not, I still want to do a stream with Ren anyway for something else. I'll find something. He's an awesome dude, and I want to do a stream with him at some point. Um, but Final Fantasy right now is the the top contender. Um, outside of the 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 collaboration stream, though, outside of the guest stream, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the collab, that's, that's the collab, that's the word we called. Um, I will be doing some Final Fantasy streams at some point in the future anyway. Probably doing things like, um, learning how to play, like, you know, uh, DPS or a healer. Or leveling some, leveling some old crafting jobs or something like, or maybe old gathering. Um, probably something along those lines. Um... I I will not be doing MSQ live uh, because I really care about... Like, games where I really, really care about the story, I've realized over this year of doing live streams that doing those live does not work out really that well. Um, I'm not sure how well it's going to work with Kingdom Hearts 3. Maybe I'll make it work somehow, but... I'm not going to be doing any MSQ stuff with Final Fantasy. The other problem with doing MSQ is that if I do MSQ, then I sort of have to do all of MSQ live. 
if that makes sense, because otherwise anyone watching the stream is going to have this very disjointed experience of the, uh, the, the story quest and it's not really going to make any sense. Whereas if I'm doing raiding, if I'm doing old job leveling, if I'm doing even just, um, old job quests or side quests or something like that, it's not as big of a deal if it's a very disjointed experience. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm most likely going to be doing like old job leveling or raiding. That that's that's going to be what it is. Uh, like I want to mess around with my thaumaturge, and there's actually like even this early in the game, there's actually a uh, a glamour that I'm trying or that I want to get. But I've already got most of it because of my my OP strat for getting gear from a um getting gear from every single uh every single dungeon run I do. The strat that's super OP is you leave at the end of the dungeon. What I mean is you leave after everyone else is left because there will always be items left in the loot table that people do not want. <laughs> every single fucking time. I don't know if this is just because I'm doing low-level stuff, um, but every single time I finish a dungeon, there is always gear left on the gear table. Here is the, uh, the set that I like. Um, this is from, like, the first raid in the entire game. And honestly, like, it's already a, it's already a glamour that I want to get. I think I have, I actually have most of it. I know I have, I don't really care about the weapon. I don't really care about my, my weapon matching the rest of my gear, but this might end up just being my glamour for, I don't know what it'd be a glamour for, actually. Maybe... I feel like it fits like a... Hmm. Maybe like a, an astrologian? Maybe maybe like an astrologian or a healer, something like that. But this is going to be the first glamour I go for. Uh, I actually kind of like the... There's actually a, another set from this dungeon I already like as well. Um, I'm probably not going to go out of my way to get this one, but I feel like I actually have most of the gear anyway. That is the Foe Strikers set. Uh, look, at some point I'm going to be a I'm going to be a glamour hunter. That, that's just how it's gonna go. Uh, but maybe I shouldn't get too distracted by it early on. I don't really care about any of the other gear. It doesn't look very good. Uh, I guess that looks kind of cool. Like you can find a pair of pants to go with it, but this no, this one no, 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 no. But acolyte and what was this one called? The foe striker. Acolyte and Foe Striker are both actually pretty cool. But there's actually a lot of, like, really, really cool, um... Do you go about item level? Uh... Even, like, early on, a lot of really cool gear you can get. Is that... Uh, wait, is that item level 80? What, what item level is that? Oh, uh, level 80... Okay, item... Okay, no, that... When it said order by item level, I thought it was going to order by item level as in lowest first, but no, it goes the other way. Um, there's obviously a lot of gear that doesn't look very good. Um, this one, for example, uh, looks kind of shit. Uh, that looks interesting. I'm not a big fan of it, but it looks it looks it looks interesting. Where do you get this one from? Uh, Bay Flox's long stop. I do not have that dungeon unlocked yet. Um, Will I spend all of my time glamour hunting early on in the game instead of playing the game? Possibly. Um, that looks cool. That looks really cool, actually. Where do you get this one from? Du uh, level 50 dungeon. Halatali hard. Okay. Uh -huh. why, am I just, why am I just sitting here looking at Final Fantasy glamours? And this is just, like, dungeon drops. There's so much other stuff you can, you know, get as well. Um, oh, no, you can see my public email and my old email. Uh, this is so bad. Anyway, that that's enough wasting time looking at Final Fantasy Glamours. Um, I think I should actually, you know, end the podcast now. Is there anything? Uh, okay, there's nothing in my. I just showed my history. There's nothing in my history that you didn't see. Um, that's the his. That's my 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 other channel. So it's fine. Um, yeah, it's gonna be it. 
Uh, I know we've been doing some solo episodes recently. That is because I am lazy and have forgotten to assign uh, to, to line up guests. But um, next week, there'll probably be no guests again. But I'm going to see if I can find someone to do after that. There's a couple of people having milling, uh, meaning to will meaning to bring back on. Um, Donald Fury, for example, meaning to talk to him for a very long time. He actually asked me if I needed someone a while back, and I just didn't have time lined up at that point. But um want to bring him back i want to bring uh hex dsl back i want to bring the real kent back and there's a bunch of other people as well that i think will be fun to talk to especially new people i i keep seeing um for show up in my comment section um and then um for not responding to my messages when i send him messages on mastodon um but <laughs> I am still trying to get Umfa onto my podcast. It will happen at some point. It will happen at some point, and I really want it to happen. Um, but until then, I will end the podcast. So if you like this podcast and you want to support my work, there is a... Is there a Patreon? Subscribes only bear paid linked in the description? There should be. If there's not, I will update my description so those are linked. Um, I've got... My main channel, that is Brody Robertson, where I do Linux videos, and I live stream sometimes. I've got a gaming channel, Brody Robertson Plays, where I live stream twice a week, upload about five super shorts, and this podcast is available as a audio release. That audio release is anywhere you can find audio podcasts. Just look up Brody Robertson, uh, Brody Robertson, look up Tech of a T, that's what it's called. Look up Tech of a T, and you'll find an RSS feed or you'll find it on whatever your favorite podcast platform is. If it is not there, let me know, and I will get it there. And then the video version is available on YouTube and Odyssey. It's been getting released late on Odyssey recently, not because I don't like Odyssey. Um, it's because Odyssey is shit, and every time I try to upload stuff, it's broken. So, yeah, stuff gets delayed, and that's sort of just what happens. Um, but until next time, I have been Brody. Um, this has been the control for my soundbar. And I'm out.